okay, now we can actually engineer profit. This ad, if we show it to a thousand people and a hundred come in and they take this offer, we know exactly how much it costs to generate a sale. And so that's why what made me initially fall in love with digital and direct response marketing is that like, oh, there's no, this isn't a guess. Like everything else in the music industry is like, are you pretty? Are you cool? Do you know the right people? Clout, clout, clout. It's so luck and, and, you know, base, but this is math. You know, you can get down to the, to the cent, to the hundredth of a cent. So that's why I love it. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 268. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me today is our special guest co-host, my partner and friend, Kyle Lemaire. Sirk, what's up, dude? Not a whole lot, friend. Just working hard. Happy to have you here, man. Happy to talk about what I think is going to be an interesting sort of exposition on uh, some opinions that we have about the music industry, some lessons learned that we have about advertising, and just kind of a general sort of sense of where advertising is going and some things that we've learned by looking outside of the music industry that if you're an artist... Or if you're working with artists, you can kind of take away from industries outside of the uh, the zeitgeist of the music business. And I kind of want to kick this off by saying, last year, our team at the IndieX agency, we managed around $3 million in ad spend for artists and bands, clients of ours. And we learned a lot from doing that, which is great. I think you can learn a lot by doing, and you can also learn a lot by watching and watching what's going on. And we did a lot of studying and watching what's going on both inside the music business by watching what other artists and bands and, you know, labels and managers and teams are doing when it comes to running ads for artists for music. And we also watched a lot of what's going on and learned a lot of what's going on outside of music and kind of got these two sort of swords in our arsenal to come together and build strategies and build effective marketing campaigns. So I want to start off by saying that because I think some of the things that we might say in this episode could be just a little controversial. For sure. Yeah. I think this also like, just to frame this, like if you're coming in here and wondering if you should continue listening to this episode, if you're a new artist or you're unfamiliar with, you know, advertising and why you might use it for your music career, this should sort all that out for you and give you a good perspective of, you know, both sides. And then if you have tried to use advertising in the past for your music career or for someone else's music career, and that wasn't very fruitful, this episode should definitely illuminate why and and set you on the right track. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a really solid disclaimer for kind of two camps of artists and their people. Yeah. We've seen digital advertising change a lot over the years. And also, you know, some of the core foundations haven't really changed at all, which is really, you know, kind of an interesting thing. We we talk on this show a lot how like platforms are changing all the time and things are happening really fast. But at the end of the day, I think when you're running marketing as a business, a small business online, your advertising is often focused on a few core objectives. And this is true, especially outside of the music business. You know, wanting to touch on this, before I was working with Cirque and our team here, I was doing a lot of work consulting with small businesses and helping helping them with their digital strategy. And at the same time was applying that to you know, artists that I was coaching and helping. And then Cirque and I met and came together. And this was years and years and years ago now, and has resulted in us having an agency where we've gotten to do some pretty miraculous things in some cases and pull out some really, really serious wins. But a lot of that and a lot of those wins and the strategies that we use come from outside the music business. And I sort of want to talk about why on this episode, why we look outside and what other artists can learn about looking outside of the business, because a lot of the things that the music industry does and teaches and employs when it comes to advertising 
I think has a flawed foundation when it comes to actually what it's supposed to do and what kind of purpose it serves in an overall marketing strategy. Yeah. Yeah. I I would add to that that like um this really hits on why we started Entrepreneur. You know, Entrepreneur is is like an arbitrage because there is a disparity between how marketing is done for small businesses and how it's done in the music industry and how, you know, how the music industry evolved just ended up at this place where the music industry doesn't try to really sell a whole lot of products. It doesn't try traditional direct response or even Madison Avenue style marketing. It has its own weird thing that we're going to go over in this episode. But the reason I started Entrepreneur is because I was working at a recording studio, for those of you who don't know, and I was the manager there. And I had tons of artists with great projects, and a lot of them couldn't break out. And I was like, I'm going to try to figure out music marketing. I learned from some of my friends in the industry what they were doing, and I just hated it. And and I was already doing digital marketing for not only my studio, but other businesses. And so I was like, why can't this work for the music industry? Why do they do things so weird? And so I started trying to apply those, you know, what I was, what I had already learned for digital marketing to the music industry and found success. And so it's really, you know, the reason that we're able to have a business and succeed here is because there's such a lack of digital and just regular marketing knowledge that's applied in the music industry. And so it's kind of our goal to go over why that might be, but to start off with sort of a primer on, okay, what is advertising used for? What is it, you know, what is, where, what is its place in the marketing stack, so to speak? Yeah, for sure. Well, let's zoom out and talk about how businesses use digital advertising. And I would argue that businesses that succeed at using digital advertising to drive marketing goals in most cases, they're using, you know, direct response type advertising to over time increase customer value. And they're working to take people from a state of unawareness to being in contact, you know, driving subscriber list, email list, text list, whatever that might look like, working to get people in their door and becoming a customer for the first time. And that can be applied to both brick and mortar businesses that you could walk into today to online businesses that you could buy from right now and then getting those people to buy over and over and over again creating you know essentially raving fans of your business that want to continue buying whether that's because you're solving a problem for them or because they just like what it is that you're putting out and you can start to see i think when you know marketing and advertising as a whole is framed that way how these same you know concepts can be applied to creative careers. However, when you look into the music business, it's not often that we see that actually happening. Yeah. I've always liked the definition that marketing is sales in advance. So it's sales without salespeople. You're supposed to use, you know, multiple mass communication methods in order to sell a product. At the very highest level where all the money in advertising is spent, you have what we call Madison Avenue style marketing, which is branding. It's really not supposed to get you to go to the store and buy a product or get you to go online and buy a product right now. It's supposed to give you the feeling that Coca-Cola is freedom or something like that, you know, some kind of the intangible feeling about a brand. Think about Apple. Yeah. Apple, Disney, Coke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so sometimes Apple does do direct response. Sometimes Apple is telling you to go buy the, you know, new iPhone for X dollar amount and the dollars and the dollar that's in there. But it's, it's more often that they're trying to do branding, which is reinforce what you're supposed to feel about Apple. In turn, that drives sales if they're able to do it effectively. So it's not to knock on Madison Avenue style branding. It's just to make you aware that's the highest level. That's where all the money's spent. Right below that, you have, I'm not trying to make you feel this way about a brand. I'm trying to make you feel this way about a product. Okay. So maybe it's, you know, uh, uh, Febreze, you know, makes you feel this way or it has this effect. It's trying to drive features and benefits about the product to get you to go buy it. And then below that, so we have the, the, the brand, the product, and then we have the offer. And this is where I would argue that the best ROI in marketing comes from for businesses below a certain size. You're not going to, you know, you're, you're below 10 million or a hundred million a year in revenue. You're not going to go out there and convince the world that your, that your brand is freedom. They don't even know your brand. Exactly. But you can go out there and you can. 
convince people to take an offer. And so that's where we really want to talk about things is the offer level. You'll also notice that in local advertising, it's all about offer. It's a sale. It's something you can go do right now. You can claim right now. And so the offer itself is the sort of the bait. It's the thing that's supposed to hook you and get you in the door. And so when, when I learned direct response and digital marketing, it started at that level. It started at the level of we are trying to make offers to the public and marketing is a lot about saturating the market with that offer. And if you have a great offer, it can take you from zero to 10 million or zero to a hundred million. There are companies, many, many companies out there online that are in that process right now, or have achieved that process where a single offer, great offer took them from zero to 10 million. And so making a great offer is something that people are like, oh, I have to get that, right? That's, that's part one. And then how do you get that offer out to the public with advertising, right? So that's the simplest view of it. It gets a little bit more complex because your advertising offer might not be the offer you're trying to get them to. You might have a front end offer that's just can't resist to get them to interact with your, your business, have a good experience, and then come back now that they trust you and they know that you're reputable and they had a good experience with you, then they get the offer that you're actually trying to sell them. And that, you know, so it gets a little bit more complex, but really we're talking about offer based advertising and marketing because it's really mathematically precise. We know how much we're supposed to make off of this offer. Okay. We, this is how much revenue we make. We can fill up to here, just getting them in the door. So we can pay out some of the money we're going to make to get them to take the offer. And that's why it becomes very mathematical because it's like, okay, now we can actually engineer profit. This ad, if we show it to a thousand people and a hundred come in and they take this offer, we know exactly how much it costs to generate a sale. And so that's why what made me initially fall in love with digital and direct response marketing is that like, oh, there's no, this isn't a guess. Like everything else in the music industry is like, are you pretty? Are you cool? Do you know the right people? Clout, clout, clout. It's so luck and, and, you know, base, but this is math. You know, you can get down to the, to the cent, to the hundredth of a cent. So that's why I love it. Yeah, for sure. I want to pull on that thread a little bit here, talking about different kinds of offers, because I think that. Uh, there's kind of an important lesson to be learned here and a corollary that we can also pull on two, two thoughts. First of all, if you go to a place like Groupon, you can see these entry level introductory offers kind of thrown at you in all sorts of different ways for all sorts of different businesses. You know, you'll find the, uh, the axe throwing comp, you know, the axe throwing fun event that you can do where it's, you know, you bring in a party and you get, you know, a, a hang for 25 bucks for the first time that you come in. You see uh, an introductory teeth cleaning and x-ray from a dentist to get you in the door. And like you said, sir, a, a lot of these offers may not make any profit for the business the first time that you come in at all. But what they're then banking on is that the experience that you have is so fun, so good, it solves a problem that then this person becomes a customer for a lifetime and you're, you know, then making money off of, uh, off of every subsequent interaction and purchase that they do. And this applies online as well, you know, just as much as you see in, uh, on Groupon and you'll see those kind of offers advertised on social media as well. You'll see that same sort of thing uh, for online businesses, free plus shipping and handling funnels, for example, discount offers for e-commerce stores. You see it all the time for makeup brands and clothing brands or all sorts of stuff online where they're probably not trying to, or in many cases, not trying to, you know, make a massive load of profit off of your one purchase and then, you know, expect you to just leave. They're figuring a math equation out to say, what's the most that I can spend to get this person to buy from me for the very first time. And then from there, I know that, you know, X percentage of those people will continue to be a customer with me. And, you know, the rest of that will subsidize my cost at the very front end for getting those people in the door. So it applies both to brick and mortar. It applies to online. Yeah. It's also important, like, cause you know, just that alone is so cool to me is that like we can get very mathematically precise about how to make money with a, a company, a product 
that is that is wrapped up in an offer, and then we can go out there and figure out how to acquire customers at a profit. But it's also cool that like, okay, maybe your offer is a huge ask. Maybe it's a thousand dollar offer, and it's really great. But no one's going to give you a thousand dollars. They don't know you yet, and so you have to build a relationship with them. And if you look at the relationship building process, that's when marketing gets really, really cool. It's when, you know, you turn things sideways and you say, okay, this is supposed to be acquired in multiple steps. And, you know, you've probably heard the analogy of like, you, you don't ask someone to marry you on the first date, right? This is why, right? You you need to walk people through a, like a sequence of steps, ideally, to get them to the big ask. And, not all advertising is supposed to end up in that big ask. So a lot of it is just breaking the ice or going on the first date. And so the reason it's important that you guys knew all that about like, you know, digital marketing and direct response marketing is because in the music industry, not only do they not use a lot of this sort of offer based marketing, but they also really don't use a whole lot of advertising effectively, and they really don't even have an offer. They don't have a product in a lot of cases. To take that a, a step further even, they don't even really have a method for generating leads. And we can talk about what that yeah. means in a second here. But you know, <laughs> at, the, at the very basic level, the idea of generating leads, for anyone listening who has never heard of that concept, is like, I want to get a way to contact you. I want you to sign up for my email list or my text list, and I'm going to give you something usually for free in exchange for your contact info so that I can keep in touch with you, give you more free stuff, and hopefully eventually sell you a product. And in many, many cases, that doesn't even exist. And that's vastly different from what you see outside of music. In almost every industry, you can find lead generating activities going on and advertising attached to it. Yeah. I, I think this all really goes back to once you understand what the music industry's primary monetization vehicle, the thing that's supposed to generate money is, then it kind of makes sense why they don't have products and they don't have offers. It used to be the case that record labels were trying to sell you CDs. And so getting the new CD was the big thing. But always, whether it was CDs or cassettes or streaming or vinyl, it was always the underlying intellectual property is the monetization vehicle. It's what's supposed to generate the money. It doesn't matter what format. This, this intellectual property existing is supposed to generate all the money. And that's why I think the music industry evolved to not be very product-focused or offer-focused is because – Look, if the song's out there on the radio and you can buy it on in a CD and you can go stream it and and it's, you know, it has all this uh equity wrapped up in it. It doesn't really matter how we sell it. It matters that it's famous. It matters that it's so overwhelmingly famous that we could wrap it up in whatever monetization vehicle, whatever offer or product, doesn't matter. And so I think that's why the, the music industry really never got those you know, those muscles of, of making a product and making an offer and why they really largely don't care about selling an artist merch or selling an artist tickets. They really don't care. They care a lot more that the artist is famous and almost all of their marketing and promotion and, you know, things that might fall outside of the scope of marketing and promotion, like, you know, things that are dishonest, it all is really geared towards elevating the fame of the artist and, and the song, the IP. I think that's a good point to make. And I think the lines have gotten blurred for the general public and for perception that artists have about that because of, you know, digital advertising being so easily accessible now that it's become kind of just a piece of that toolkit of like, we're going to try to use this to build the perception of fame or build actual fame as opposed to building audience and connection and people, you know, that can support a business. I think that that line has gotten blurred and you don't have to look too far to see this happening. Just recently, I was doing some research on artists on the Billboard uh, Hot 100 chart, and I was looking to see what kind of ads are these artists running? Like, what's going on right now? And the overwhelming majority are running, you know, for the most part, traffic to streaming services, and that's pretty much it. 
And we could really get probably get into the nitty gritty here about some of the problems behind that, especially for some of these artists that are massive, right? Like they don't really need to be spending tons of money to be driving their fans somewhere where the fans are already going to get them doing something that I can almost guarantee is not subsidizing the cost of the spend, right? And there's no exchange of anything as far as driving that relationship forward. There's no there's no lead generating activity going on. You're not getting the contact info. You're banking on the fact that you can or on the idea that you hope that these fans will stream that this one user will stream multiple times to try and subsidize your cost of doing this. And there's really no, you know, further path to selling anything or making an offer. Yeah. I, I would say that even you know, and record labels spend a lot of money on advertising. It's not nothing compared to what they spend on other things. I would say it's pretty small, but they still spend. And I, I would venture a guess that they don't give a flying F about, about whether someone clicks on the ad to go stream it. I would bet that their media buyers are laughing. They don't have to do anything in the way of results. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the artist's face and the name of the song is omnipresent across the whole internet. Because again, they're trying to create the perception that X artist is way more famous than they actually are. And you can see that in all of the other forms of you know, major label and record industry marketing, um, blog PR. Okay. What's the point here? The point here is to ensure that the artist gets written about, even if the writer doesn't give an F about the artists. So they're willing to pay to, which, you know, when you read a blog, a music blog, your anticipation is not that you're being shilled something that the writer was paid to shill. Your expectation is that they're curating their tastemakers and, and they're trying to show you good stuff. But that's usually not the case because, you know, the record industry is looking for any angle where they can influence the popularity or perceived popularity of an artist to make the IP really famous. And so, whether it be botting streams and botting views on YouTube, which we know for a fact they've done, and, and go check out Brandman uh, Sean and Brandman Network. They have a bunch of recent content about the practice of botting in the industry and how it's very, very common. Whether it be that, whether it be uh, pay for pay for play payola on radio and streaming uh, playlists, whether it be blog PR, whether it be paid appearances on talk shows and TV. There's all different types of ways that that people with deep pockets can use to influence the perceived popularity of an artist. And that's the whole goal. Now, the world we come from is completely different, where it's like, how can I lower my average cost of getting an interested party? Right. So we're running advertising. We're trying to get people to respond. That's why it's called direct response. We want them to call in or send in an order form or go to a website. And we want to be able to track that they did that so that we can know how much it costs to get someone to do that. Right. And so that's the whole goal is, is reduce that cost and also be able to charge a premium to be able to get the highest lifetime value for, for each of those people who walks in through the door what we might call a lead for each one of those, we want to increase or maximize the lifetime value so that the difference between the cost of getting them there and the actual lifetime value is wide. So that's why in direct response, you'll see people raising prices rather than lowering them often, because if they can provide enough value so that it justifies the costs, then they should maximize that cost as much as possible. And, and they're often, you know, the growth in a direct response company is often, you know, customer led growth. And so that's just to say that, like, if you want to advertise, there's a lot better ways you can do it than how the music industry is doing it. I would argue that the music industry is better off putting all their money on blog PR, paid editorial playlists, you know, uh, botting, all that stuff is going to do way more to make a person appear famous than ads. And a lot of music industry folks don't even like ads because it creates the appearance that they're trying to make the person seem popular. And all the other methods create the appearance that they just are popular. Advertising is the only one that gives away that they're trying and they don't like that. That's such a good point because I can't tell you how many conversations we've had with 
people who are interested in working with us at IndieX, where when it comes down to talking about advertising and what we do, there's an aversion to it because it, it sucks, honestly, because of indoctrination in the industry of like the idea of appearing that you're marketing there's an immediate aversion to like, I don't want to do that because I don't want fans to see the same thing twice. And we've talked about this before on the show where it's like people are going to need to see the thing more than once for them to take an action. But that just flies over the heads of, you know, the business in here. It's, it's wild how the aversion around advertising comes out as soon as you say like, yeah, we're trying to we're, we're advertising to get someone to take an action. And it's like, oh, I, I don't know if I want to do that because people are going to say, oh, look at this ad or I saw this thing advertised. And all of a sudden it kind of, you know what I mean? It kind of like reveals the man behind the curtain a little bit. And for us, like, that's not a problem. But you can see how based on everything we've been saying so far, like – that would be a huge problem <laughs> for the way that things operate. Yeah, it, it is a huge problem. I think a good corollary here, or a good way to look at it is like e-commerce, right? E-commerce, you're selling a product that's often between $20 and $100. And your main way to acquire customers as an online business selling a product is through digital advertising. And so that sort of sector of industry is the best example of this really tight, this really tight correlation, this need to have advertising be incredibly effective and low costs and need your product margins to be incredibly high and to have your offer be incredibly enticing so that you maximize. In the music industry, there's no, it makes complete sense, as we've just explained, that there's no interest whatsoever in any of that. Yeah. Okay? None. And really what you need to look at is like, you're not a major label. And even if you were on a major label, you're not their favorite. Ooh, okay. Ooh. You're not the one they're putting all the money into. Okay. There's the sting. Yeah. Yeah. Most people signed to a major label, they were signed as insurance. As in, like, if you do something special where we actually would want to put money behind you, we're going to lock you down now. Okay. So it's an insurance policy. They're willing to pay out 25K advance to make sh to, to insulate themselves from the possibility that you blow up. And they can reap benefit there. And then they will put money into you and they will make you the next Drake and they will bot your streams and get you on all the playlists that they will do that. But they don't do it for a broad majority of artists. If you're an indie artist and you're trying to use these same methods to appear more popular than you are, you do not have deep enough pockets. You're not going to win at that game. And so that's why I think there's been so much confusion and anguish and pain for indie artists who look to the, the music industry model and say, why can't, how, you know, like they're floundering because they don't have $20 million to throw at making themselves appear like the most popular thing in the world. So the good news is, is that you can just use these methods as they were intended. What you can do is you can take something of your music career, of your artistic career, a token of it, whether it be an album or a piece of merchandise, and you can make that your offer. And then you can go out to the world through cold traffic, just like any e-commerce business would do. And you can make that offer at scale and you can do exactly what they pull off, which is make a premium. The advertising costs a certain amount to bring in a customer if you if the value of the product you're selling minus the cost of making it is more than that then you're you're laughing. The reason you're laughing is because you now have a margin on the whole chain. Getting them to be aware of you, getting them into the door, getting them to make the purchase, getting it out to them. Once it's in their hands, you have a little bit of money left over. And the reason that that's so awesome is because you can go from spending $20 a day on advertising to spending $2,000 a day. You can scale it up because it's all digital. So the cost of scaling it up is just a multiple of the advertising costs. It doesn't eat into your margin. And that's why it's so cool. If you're making $4 spending $20 a day, you can be making $4,000 spending $20,000 in time. And we literally not only done this for artists in the, in the agency, but many, many members of our team and myself, when I was doing this for independent artists, were able to pull it off. It's just the e-commerce model applied to an artistic career. And there's a few benefits there. One is that 
fans stick around a lot longer than squatty potty buyers. You know, <laughs> people who buy an e-commerce product, they don't have as much brand loyalty as fans of music. So the lifetime value of a music fan can be far higher than the lifetime value of an e-commerce customer once generated. So we have a benefit there. And then on top of that, it's a lot easier to get people involved in listening to music than it is to get them involved in investigating a product offer. So there's a few tailwinds that can push you forward as long as you adopt this model of I'm going to create a product, I'm going to create an offer, and I'm going to try to create a premium, a margin off of marketing that offer. And you can do, do it small. Once you get that $4, you know it can be 4000 in time. I hope that makes sense. We talked a lot about this on an episode we did probably about a year ago on some of the, the big advertising mistakes that we see artists with big fan bases making. And really, Cirque was just explaining essentially a math equation to advertising and making money through digital marketing. And if you've got an audience and you've got some name recognition, which you know, there's a lot of artists out there that do. And a lot of artists out there that probably have more name recognition than they realize. That's something we've seen time and time again in the agency. You can then adapt offers around what you're doing. But what we so often see out there is just like, okay, I'm an artist with, you know, a million followers on Instagram and I've got a big ass email list. Now I'm just going to run ads to Spotify. At this point, if you can't see the, where, where the, the big missed opportunity is and the money just left on the table, it's immense and it's right there in front of us. And that's so much of what we do at the agency is help those kinds of artists craft offers and then bring them out to market, both to the people that know them and care about them, but also fans or, or potential fans that are just kind of sitting there in the world that maybe aren't necessarily the most interested in your music, but they I know a little bit about you or have heard of you before or maybe heard a song and you can captivate them with an offer that is really, really cool. Turns them into a fan. Yeah, yeah. I want to go back for a second because we said that like we don't even think record labels are trying to get the Spotify stream. I don't think that's the goal of all this advertising. But just to walk you through it, if that was what they were trying to do, they're losing money hand over fist. You know, we think about advertising as we feed in creative, which is the ad. We feed in audience and parameters, you know, who is it going to run to for how long at what spend. And then we have a product that it's leading to. And that product gets us a piece of revenue. And that revenue is ideally far higher than the cost of running the ad when you add everything up. On Spotify, they're getting, you know, four tenths of a cent. It maybe it, it, you know, goes really, really well. And someone who clicks over ends up representing 40 cents over a given month. That's not enough to cover the cost of the advertising because big bucks, dude. Yeah. Huge it's not, dollars. It's, <laughs> just lining my pockets from all the ad spend. It's not good. Yeah. So there's just no way for that to make a return on their investment, which is why I don't think that's their goal. I don't think their goal is to ROI. Their goal is to create omnipresence and brand recognition for their artists under the guise of like Spotify advertising. No, I think that's a really good hypothesis. And I think it's part of the reason that the lines have gotten blurred too around like, oh, I'm going to target, you know, fans or potential fans in these trigger cities in third world countries or developing countries. You know, on one hand, it's kind of like a veiled attempt at like, oh, look, I can drive down the cost of my clicks. And for anyone who's, you know, slightly digitally minded, they might say like, oh, that's a cool thing. And I can talk about that as a talking point in my marketing pod here at, you know, management team A or record label B, uh, not to throw shade, but I'm throwing shade a little bit. <laughs> you can talk about that then. Or, oh, I'm look at me, look, I'm driving all these you know, new fans, and there's a lot of engagement happening, even if it's bots, which maybe you would have done anyway. Maybe you would have just bought a whole bunch of bots on a boosted post or whatever. So I think that that's troubling because then independent artists or, you know, just any kind of artist really and their team see that and they're like, okay, well, we should probably emulate that, right? No, please don't. <laughs> yeah. know, that the, know that the intentions behind it are not true. Yeah. I think it's important to say that like you can run ads to Spotify 
if your intention is to build data signals to your Spotify while also building a what we call a retargetable audience. So whenever someone clicks over to Spotify, you can talk to them again through a different ad. And we use that. We leverage that. But to sell products, right? There's an end goal here. I don't think the record industry is largely doing that with their Spotify and streaming ads. If they are, I haven't seen it <laughs> in any you know massive scale. Yeah. So Jonah McLean is a member of our team. His producer name is Dukes. And right now he's running a free, what we call a free post shipping and handling funnel. For those of you out there who don't know what that is, it's where you're offering a free product on the front end. All they have to do is pay for the shipping and handling. So it's a cool deal. Just pay for us to ship it. We don't want to pay that cost and we'll give you the item for free. It's done with books. It's done with makeup kits. It's done with lots of things in order to acquire buyers and give them a good experience so that you can get to that bigger offer that makes you the margin you need. It's a way to generate leads in a way that are already buyers. They already bought something. On the back end of that, you can make further offers while they're checking out so that even when you acquire a customer, it's not at a loss. Even when you're giving them a free product, it's not at a loss because the profit from the other things you're offering them on checkout makes up for the difference. So Deuce is running one of these, his first funnel. When he ran it to begin with, he was getting like 2x return on ad spend. And what that means is that he's making a premium. Just like I said, if you can make $4 a day, you can make 4000 a day. You just need to dial in the offer at that low spend get that premium there, and then start spending more, scaling it up. But the cool thing about digital marketing, direct response marketing to me has always been, we can build this machine at the low level, not you know lose a bunch of money until it's running how we want it, and then we can blast spend at it and, and try to maintain that margin. It's really cool. So he built that funnel, started scaling it up, but his secondary offers after the free offer weren't performing very well and he wanted them to perform better. So he tweaked it a little bit. He put a pre-order for his upcoming record on the back end of this free offer and it started getting 4X return on ad spend. So for every dollar put in, $4 comes out, okay? And now he, he has a really healthy margin to scale that up with. I think that all indie artists should be doing that type of advertising and that type of fan acquisition. I don't think it makes sense for indie artists to be trying to acquire fans for free when they can do it for money. If you don't have a product yet, that's one thing. If you don't have enough music out there where you could create a product yet, that's that's one thing. But I think trying to get to that point is because once you're there, you know, Dukes can spend many Ks throughout the month, generate many fans more than someone who who is bleeding money. They're locked to whatever their budget is. He's locked to however much he can spend before that margin erases because the cost of acquiring goes up. So really a different scenario. And it's how all digital businesses that practice direct response marketing do it. They build a, a margin at the low level and they scale it up and they grow. And so I, I, I think that's what we want to hammer home here is that like advertising for us is that it's not, you know, it's not advertising that the new single is out now, go stream it on Spotify. It's, it's pushing an offer and a product that gets you a premium that pays for the advertising and then some, and then trying to spend as much on that as you can. Until it doesn't work anymore. Until it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Plug something new in. And there's a lot of ways to do this. Like Cirque was saying, these kinds of funnels have happened with books. They've happened with CDs. They've happened with merch products. The creativity is kind of the beauty in this. I think you, you know, you, you construct an offer and you build it around products or a, a product or multiple products and you add value to it. And then you make it something that is irresistible for a potential customer to take. And you can put that out there in a number of different ways. You can put it out there as an offer that requires some kind of upfront dollar value. You put it out there as something that just requires an email opt-in and then is sold on the back end. There's so many different ways to structure these kinds of funnels that have some kind of end goal of monetization. And that can happen, you know, in the immediate, it can happen in the, you know, medium term, it can happen in the longer term. And I think that that's important for artists to think about. But the key thing here is you're not just driving people over to 
something where they're unknowingly giving you four tenths of a cent over and over and over again, especially if you already have a fan base that would be willing to part with, you know, real dollars and pull out their wallet. Yeah. I mean, a lot of digital marketing, typically a business's main offer that, that they make their money and are able to grow on is not what they're going to show to you right away. So they need to get you to a place where you already believe because of your past experiences with them that they're going to deliver. And they're not going to be able to convince you of that when you don't know them from a hole in the wall. So a lot of the advertising, a lot of the direct response marketing that goes on is building that relationship with, with free offers, with low cost offers, with content even. <laughs> the point being that like so much of getting people to that level is a lot of the spend. When you look at like, okay, I sell a hundred dollar product. It costs me $20 to acquire a customer. I make an $80 premium. It costs me 20 additional dollars to make that product or fulfill it. So I'm left with $60 for every customer I create. Okay. So a lot of that $20 advertising spend is just getting to the place where they're ready to buy a hundred dollar product, not even selling it. Selling it is like almost automatic once you get them there. Okay. The reason I told you that is that there are so many artists out there. They've already completed the, the, the $20 spend. They've already built no like and trust with hundreds of thousands of people. And they're looking around like, how do we, uh, make more money? Let's, uh, let's try to like, you know, get on some blogs or some shit, like some crazy idea. Like I just need one playlist placement, man. I swear. <laughs> yeah. So like I told you the reason entrepreneur exists, we see this arbitrage, a difference between the marketing, the music industry practices and the marketing that we know how to do. Okay. Why does NDX exist? Our agency, we see an arbitrage between the way that most, like a broad majority of already popular artists think they're going to make money and how we know that they can make money tomorrow. We literally, all we have to do is just do the very obvious thing any digital marketer would do with that audience is sell them products. And you wouldn't, you would not believe not only how many artists out there aren't doing this appropriately, but how difficult it is to convince them to do it. So much of the, the client relationship building process for us is just like, please let us make you money. You know, <laughs> please let us just do, do the dumb, easiest thing that we've ever done in digital marketing is to like make an offer to a bunch of people who already are waiting and want an offer from you. No, literally, you, you think it's a joke. There's money. There's m like multiples just laying there. That is just, it needs to be scooped up. That's it. <laughs> I think this is probably an appropriate time to mention if you fit into that category or you work with an artist that fits into that category, we'd love to help you scoop up some of that revenue that's just being left on the table. So we'd love to hear from you. I'll make sure we leave a link in the show notes for our IndieX application. If you are an artist with a large fan base or you manage an artist with a large fan base and you're missing out on the e-commerce revenue that is just sitting there and there's nobody on your team that really wants to take advantage and your eyes glaze over when they try to talk to you about, you know, Spotify being the perfect monetization arm. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. We'll leave a link in the show notes. That's my quick pitch for IndieX here. I think in so many ways, that's just a great, sort of synopsis of what Indopreneur is trying to teach Cirque and what IndieX is doing. And there's, yeah, there's so many ways to do it. And I think here's a, here's a great example from the agency that kind of illustrates what you were saying about artists that have put in time, effort, and energy into getting fans to the point where they are ready to take the you know, the bigger offer that might not be out there. One of our, one of our agency clients, he has been for years giving his fans content, great music, merch offers, free offers, you know, free lead magnets, bribes, kind of you name it. We've been doing so much digital marketing infrastructure. And what that's turned into now is a touring revenue stream. And, and this goes beyond products sold. This can even go into, you know, experiences sold. It's turned into a touring revenue stream. I actually just got off the phone with him before we started recording this episode, where now we 
every year, book out his whole year worth of tour dates through house concerts to his fans and to cold traffic at this point too. But you know, to illustrate the point about warm audiences and building up an audience that knows, likes, and trusts you, he's built up this audience of people where if he goes out to them in ads and in emails and says, I'm booking a whole tour out this year, I want to come play in your backyard, your living room, your basement, you know, let me know where you're at and I'd love to come and sends people straight to an application. He's booking gigs for thousands of dollars and shortcutting what he used to do with booking agents and venues and doing it all himself. And he's done that because he's built up this relationship with these fans where they've gotten so much value from him in the past, whether that be through purchases that they've made, whether it's been through the experiences they've had with his music and just listening through his content, through the free offers that he's made, that he's gotten to a point where he can now go out there and we're at the time of the recording going into the second quarter and his whole year of touring is almost booked out, which is crazy. Meaning like booked out and guaranteed to make money. That's wild. Yeah, no, it really is. And so, yeah, like just to leave you with it, there is, if if you felt like there's this impossibility to being an independent artist, it's like, you're right. There is. Okay. The people we service at NDX, they didn't necessarily grow to the level they have through the types of methods we would employ for them. Okay, so extracting value from a fan base is a lot different from building a fan base. And if you're not incredibly lucky, okay, it's going to be difficult to build a fan base organically. It's just going to be really hard. Like, it's going to be running in sand. Because either you're incredibly lucky and you're just very naturally talented at social media and memes and creating content, or you're incredibly lucky in that you met the right people and I really even argue like kind of unlucky because, you know, you, you ended up <laughs> signing up with someone who now owns a lot of your revenue and they decided they were going to put their, their gas behind you. And so the people who end up building large fan bases that aren't called fan bases, there's an element of luck and, and some would argue like, you know, bad fortune in, in sort of their path. And so it's not reasonable to expect that you're going to get from just starting out to where they're at. And even still, I would recommend these methods that we've gone over in this episode for you. Why? Because even though you won't build a hundred thousand fans in a year, probably through this method, you will build maybe 10,000 and you'll make money while doing it. You won't go broke doing it. And so that's kind of why we recommend it is that like, would you rather, you know, moonshot and hope that you get uber famous or would you rather, you know, slow and steady build a fan base and not lose money doing so? That's kind of my thesis. So, <laughs> yeah, I think and again, like kind of going back zooming way out to the ideas that we talked about at the beginning of this episode to wrap up here. If you start to pay attention outside of the music business, it will be like the scales fall off of your eyes because you'll start seeing this in other industries. You'll start seeing this in, you know, the businesses that are in your neighborhood and your city. And when you can start to think within those frameworks, it's it's almost like a it's almost a think local kind of mindset, although I'm not suggesting you go and try to do this only locally by any stretch. In fact, I would probably discourage you from doing that. But when you can see it, you know, in the local microcosm, you can apply it to yourself as an artist way easier than you can if you're looking at Beyonce or Ed Sheeran or any massive artist that has, you know, essentially a money machine behind them and is doing things that, aren't really all that effective anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll say this, you know, our good friend and teammate, Andy Hunter, he started off with this method of like, okay, I'm going to build a fan base, but I'm also going to like sell a product. His product was tickets and touring. And that was his main product besides free push and handling funnels and CDs that he did for five years. And now he's festival billing. Now he's on that flyer with those big name acts, those legacy acts and current rising major label darlings, but he owns a hundred percent of his business. He didn't have to lose money while getting there. And it's just a way different. It's a position of strength, you know, 
playing from a place of strength. And so, um, yeah, I would say that that's the, that's the most covetable example. Like, you know, the people in our team who are able to achieve this, the most covetable example I can think of is like, man, they did it for themselves. They use these methods to do so. And they didn't have to rely on like outside externalities, uh, luck, chance, signing over your whole career to someone else to do it. I think that's the coolest thing in the world. I agree a hundred percent. This was fun. I think if we could sum up our thesis here to give you guys something to maybe have sweet dreams about or nightmares, depending on how you view all of this, the music industry doesn't advertise super well because it doesn't market super well. And you can learn a lot about digital marketing and how to build a business for yourself. Slow and steady wins the race by looking outside of music and learning a little bit about how businesses do digital marketing. And hopefully this gives you guys some food for thought and some things to chew on and maybe, just maybe, some things to bring to, you know, the people in your circle or your team to say, hey, I think we should be doing this a little bit different. And that's kind of our goal here is to just buck the norm a little bit. And so I hope that you take some of these ideas and you do that with us. Thank you very much for having me, Jack. Thanks for being here, man. We'll catch you guys next time on Creative Juice. Peace out, Indies.